Okay. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar today. Um, Happy New Year. Uh, I know it's not been the best start to the new year, but um, hopefully um, uh, things will get better from here. In um, We um, have uh, a webinar for you today on the green paper, um, and um, hopefully you will be able to see my screen now. Um, Speaking with me today are my colleagues, uh, Mike Moosedale, um, a partner in the government infrastructure team, Louise Bennett, um, a senior associate in the government and infrastructure team, Rachel Whitaker, uh, who is uh, a procurement health partner, um, and myself, Peter Ware. Um, we will um, be um, looking at the green paper, um, which was issued just before Christmas. If you've got any questions about anything we're talking about, then please do put them in the chat and we will try and pick them up at the end. If you've got any technical questions about um, anything that's going wrong from the tech side, please don't email me, but to email my colleague, um, um, Natasha, who is um, titled Event Assistant, and she will try and help you. Um, and with that, I will um, kick off today's webinar. So, um, as you will be aware, the green paper outlines the government's uh, proposed changes to the UK procurement regime, which are possible, of course, as a result of the completion of our exit from the European Union. Um, the changes um, that are set out in the green paper are at least at first glance um, radical in parts. Um, and definitely can uh, um, provoke um, conversation and some things to think about and we'll try and take you through those but of course this is just part of a consultation exercise for now and that consultation period um, is 12 weeks um, completing on the 10th of March 2021 so there is a bit of time to think about the changes and of course respond to the consultation and um, Mike um, is going to talk about how we might help with that at the end of the webinar. The um, structure of the webinar today really is going through each of the eight chapters, summarising the key points from each of the chapter in the green paper and trying where that's possible to compare that against the current regimes. We will um, try to offer our thoughts on the proposed changes, both um, good and bad, and uh, give our views on those. Um, uh, but obviously, this is um, still that consultation phase, so there is an opportunity to put forward those uh, uh, points of view where we think there is a problem or, or where you think they might not work in practice. So, Starting with me, um, I'm going to talk about chapters one and two. So the, the first chapter really is um, um, changing the underpinning principles of public procurement. Um, but with a real aim to um, of the government to change the way public procurement works to better reflect the UK and in particular obviously England uh, uh, and Wales um, but obviously there's an opportunity for some of the devolved administrations to divert from that if they want to but really um, concentrate on six new underpinning um, key principles. This changes and moves away from regulation 18 which um, most of you will be familiar with being a quality without discrimination, transparency and proportionality. And moving forward to these six new ones, which are public good, value for money, transparency, integrity, fair treatment of suppliers and non-discrimination. Some of these um, new concepts um, are not currently in the regulations, as we've seen, or indeed in the case law, and that will have um, some implications in terms of how you will understand that if they were implemented into a new set of regulations or primary law. And I think the first one really is public good, which is an interesting addition. Um, this really does seem to go hand in hand with the recently launched social value model, which has been um, put forward by um, Whitehall. But it really will potentially give further scope for contracting authorities to think about how they might underpin um, their procurement policies and their principles and the way in which um, they um, might um, run those procurements. Importantly, of course, though, um, 
the government is suggesting that its priorities will be set out in a national procurement policy statement. And this is a policy statement once um, set out which con contracting authorities must have regard. Um, and I'll come back to that in the, in the next slide. The introduction of value for money as a key principle um, it is also an interesting point um, and differs slightly from um, the approach to evaluation of uh, value in the current set of regulations. But we will look at that in a bit more detail under evaluation a bit later on. One of the key omissions, though, is from the current principles is the end of proportionality, or at least proportionality as an underpinning principle um, is not specifically identified as um, uh, one of those key six. Okay. But potentially, of course, it is covered by fair and equal treatment. Um, and that is perhaps one that we might look at um, from a clarification point of view. So the National Procurement Strategy. So the government is suggesting in the Green Paper that um, it will be separately legislating to require contracting authorities to have regard to national priorities of strategic importance in public procurement. And those will be published in a national procurement policy statement. In the Green Paper, it sets out that the following will be included, but I don't think it's suggesting that this is an exclusive list. Um, social value, including economic and social and environmental outcomes, creating new businesses, jobs and skills in the UK, improving supplier diversity and resilience and tackling climate change and reducing waste. But I think what this does do um, is it suggests a greater level of direction and intervention um, for all public sector purchasing than is the current position. Um, it will be interesting, I guess, to see how much compulsion um, central government will have over sub-central contracting authorities through this nat national procurement statement um, when it is implemented in practice. The next thing that's set out in um, Chapter 1 is a new oversight body. Um, the suggestion um, in the Green Paper is that a new unit within government will be established to oversee the running of public procurement by contracting authorities. Um, this new unit would broadly be responsible for intervention in live procurements, i.e. where there is a problem where procurements are running, and will, it will have the power to issue improvement notices to drive up standards in contracting authorities. It will also um, monitor to assess and address systematic gaps in commercial capability. So it will be looking at the abilities of contracting authorities, um, uh, particularly as those apply to the bedding in in period when the new rules are being implemented. But what it is clear from the Green Paper is that it would not be the intention of government that this body would replace the courts as the body responsible for overseeing procurement challenges. So this is a body which would be there to monitor procurement performance on an ongoing basis, as opposed to dealing with specific challenges which contractors might have um, in relation to the procurements that they are involved in at that specific point. But again, um, putting this alongside the national procurement strategy, this will again mean that central government will have a power to intervene in local situations or in more situations certainly than it does at the moment. Um, and question for local government and sub-central bodies like CCGs and health bodies and universities as to whether this will allow intervention in the procurement decisions which historically have been entirely determined by those bodies provided of course they were in line with the um, public procurement regime as it stands um, at the moment. Moving quickly on to um, chapter two, um, one of the criticisms which is often leveled at the procurement regime at the moment is that it is unnecessarily complex when it comes to the um, number of sets of regulations which are in place. And um, the Green Paper suggests that uh, four of those will be amalgamated into one set of regulations. Um, and, and principally, I guess, for most of you um, on the webinar, 
that will be the merger of the public contract regulations, the concession contracts and the utility contract regulations. And the proposal is to replace all of those into a single set of regulations. And the proposal is to have a structure where you have a main set of rules underpinning all procurements um, with um, sections um, in regulations delivering with it with um, particular sectors which are governed at the moment with different sets of regulations. Um, the key um, underpinning um, message is that actually what they want to try and do is to retain a lot of the flexibilities allowed in the UCR and the CCR when it comes to drafting the set of consolidated regulations. And, and I guess for those um, having to deal with the PCR, that would be a welcome thing because ultimately um, PCR um, is in part um, overly complex, whereas um, particularly the utilities contract regulations, there's a great deal of flexibility in those to um, run procurements in a more fluid way. But uh, I guess what I'd say is that I wouldn't underestimate the task of trying to create that single set of regulations, because particularly the utilities contract regulations are very different in parts um, to those in the public contract regulations. Um, and on, on that front, um, there is a question as whether they'll have the ability to achieve that simplification of the procurement regime when they are trying to bring together all of those disparate parts. And, and, and on top of that, and uh, sort of an interesting point as an aside is, will the more lightly regulated sectors, particularly those in utilities area, welcome um, a set of regulations which may potentially impose um, more um, controls over their activity. Of course, we need to wait and see what those new regulations would look like, um, but um, that is something potentially to mull over, and particularly if you're in the utilities sector, something you might want to talk about in terms of your response to the consultation. With that, I will hand over to um, my colleague Rachel, who is going to talk about um, chapters three and four. Thanks, Peter. So afternoon everybody. Chapter three of the Green Paper takes us into looking at the types of procedures that they're proposing will be available going forward. You'll see on the screen there the list of the seven identifiable procurement procedures that we currently have. Um, you could arguably add the light touch regime to that as a slightly different procedure, um, but there's a huge variety of procedures there that grown up over time and what's been recognised by government in the Green Paper and there's also some significant overlap between some of those procedures. The particular overlap coming between competitive dialogue procedure and the competitive procedure with negotiation. In terms of our general use of the procedures and those of you running procurements you'll be well aware of this, by far and above the, the most used procedures are the open and the restricted procedures. The innovation partnerships and design contests kind of come in at the end, but they actually account for less than 7% of the procedures that we run in a year. So there's been a real focus now on streamlining the procedures going forward to make sure that the ones that we have are fit for purpose and actually do all genuinely serve a different purpose. Next slide, please. So going forward, three procedures. The open procedure for simple, more straightforward procedures, um, purchases, new competitive flexible procedure. So this is now an attempt to give contracting authorities lots more freedom to negotiate, innovate and design their processes in order to get the best results for themselves. And a limited tendering procedure, which is essentially Regulation 32 by a new name, but with some additions to it. So if we have a look at those and the implications of that. The big notable impact of the proposals is that the light touch regime is abolished. That's the proposal. So that means that all those services that currently fall within Schedule 3, health and social care services, etc., they're going to be treated the same way as all of the services contracts in the future. Two key points to note on this is that the the practical implication of that is that for those services contracts, the obligation to carry out a competitive tender is going to bite at a much lower level. So currently we're around £663,000 as a threshold for LTR, and that's now going to come in at the same level as it does for other services. Whilst the actual procedure, and we'll see that in a moment, that they will be required to use will be very similar and have a lot of the flexibilities of the current LTR. Actually, what 
it will it mean in practice is that lots of those smaller health and social care contracts start to get caught by formal competitive tendering processes. And it remains to be seen actually how well that's going to play out both with contracting authorities, but also with some of the bidders and the providers who operate in that market. And I guess thinking in particular about kind of charitable organisations, voluntary organisations who may not have the infrastructure and the resources to participate in competitive bid opportunities that some of their you know, the, the, the competitors in the market, the private sector organisations do. So for them, it could be a real challenge to see that threshold dropped. Having said that, and for those of you that specifically work in the health sector, you'll be aware that there has been discussion for some time now, um, emanating from the NHS itself, that the permissioning of clinical healthcare services should sit outside of the procurement regime that we observe. At the moment, there are still proposals from the NHS that that's the case. And the Green Paper doesn't resolve that question. It doesn't put forward a position. It's taken the decision that that is a, an issue that should be decided by the Department of Health and Social Care. So there's still a, a push to have healthcare services outside of the prevailing procurement regime, but it's not something that's been determined as part of this set of proposals. It's something that will be looked at in terms of any proposals for a new NHS bill that may come forward as a result of the kind of the lobbying and the proposals put forward by NHSE and I. So going back to what the actual, this means for our procedures going forward, all the contracts that are caught by the procurement regime have the ability to benefit from the current flexibilities in the LTR. Um, so, like I said, free reign to design your processes, but it remains to be seen actually whether contracting authorities will embrace some of that flexibility or whether actually, at least in the short term, they stick very much to the tried and tested procedures that they know that they're comfortable with. They have processes set up for them and they know how to run them with limited risk. Obviously, flexibility provides creativity, but that also starts to move us into the area of potentially um, opening us up to challenge when things are done differently and different interpretations are taken of processes. May also be that bidders may not actually feel like they like that flexibility. For some of them, the certainty of how processes have to be run is useful in terms of managing their resources and their own efficiencies. You may find that the bidder market actually has something to say about the fact that they could be facing different types of procurement processes for similar contracts across the country. And that, of course, will have an impact on their resources. So whilst there's definitely going to be tools there to change how we procure going forward, if these rules are adopted, then obviously the question about whether we embrace those is a separate one altogether. Next question, next slide, please. So looking at just a bit more detail about the new competitive flexible procedure, there's actually nothing in here that I think will be too concerning for contracting authorities when you look at what you'll be required to do. So your process will need to be consistent with the new procurement principles and the opportunity will need to be advertised and notices published in line with transparency requirements, all very much as you would do now. Contract notice will have to contain basic information, again something that we all used to doing, and will also need to comply with the proposed and published requirements on selection and evaluation criteria. The time limits on participation and submission of final tenders have to be reasonable and proportionate, so very similar to the current LTR, and comply with the GPA um, time period, so bringing ourselves in line with the, um, the rules around the government procurement agreement from the WTO. So as I said, I don't think there's necessarily anything in there to cause undue concern, but what is clear is that there are significant areas where the flexibilities of the LTR can be adopted across all procurements. Next slide, please. So the new open procedure, there is really very little change here from what we currently recognise as the open procedure, and it will continue to operate in a similar way. I think the key change here is that the government is proposing that this procedure is also going to be opened up to defence and security procurements as well. And that moves us on to the new limited tendering procedure. So regulation 32 effectively by a different name is very similar to Regulation 32 and the majority of the grounds, in fact, the grounds in Regulation 32 will stay un broadly unchanged from the current position. The big change is the addition of a new circumstance in which a direct award will be permissible. And this is what's being termed in the case of crisis. And a crisis is 
broadly defined at the moment as an event and it's all on there for you on the screen, an event which clearly exceeds the dimensions of harmful events in everyday life and which substantially endangers or restricts the life or health of people, where measures are required to protect public morals, order or safety, where measures are required to protect human, animal or plant life or health, and contracting authorities, this is the key point, will only be able to rely on this ground where the Minister for the Cabinet Office has declared a crisis and then only to address the immediate requirements. Now, I think we can see that given the circumstances that we're currently living through, the way that the pandemic has unfolded and the pressures that that's put on the procurement systems, why, when the government's been considering the scope of procurement reform, this might very well have been focused in on and considered in great detail. But I think it's going to be one of those areas where actually the devil will be in the detail when we see the drafting if it moves forward because there is a possibility that that does not provide necessarily much more scope for direct awards than actually can be achieved under the current Regulation 32.2c um, provisions that are available. Obviously, there are some limitations on that in terms of events being unforeseeable and not attributable to a contracting authority. But for many people, in the case of crisis, will seem very similar to the urgency circumstances in 32.2c as it stands now. I guess one of the other things when we're thinking about it that we reflected on is that the use of this ground will be subject to that declaration coming from the Minister for the Cabinet Office that, that there is a crisis in existence. And so the question has to be asked about how fast those declarations will come through and whether that in itself could impede the use of this as a ground and whether people will fall back on the more traditional Regulation 32.2c provisions. In terms of the notices that go with this, it's worth picking up on a couple of points because there is an increased focus on transparency, both in terms of this chapter of the paper, but literally flowing through all of the paper itself. And so it would be mandatory under the government's proposals for contracting authorities to publish a notice before entering into any contract it proposes to directly award and to, award and to publish a contract award notice as well. There's also a tightening of the rules around standstill procedures. So except in the case of contracts awarded through extreme urgency or crisis situations, contracting authorities will be required to observe a 10 day standstill period. Okay, next slide, please. So that takes us through chapter three and the types of procedures available and chapter four starts to look at the government's proposals around actually how we use selection and evaluation criteria. Most notable proposal is, or possibly not notable, depends how you view it, is the change from replacing meat, the most economically advantageous tender, with the most advantageous tender test. Terminology is in line with the government procurement agreement, and I don't think we necessarily need to read too much into the removal of the word economic, because obviously the commercial benefits and the commercial um, solutions and proposals put forward in tenders will still remain very crucial to the evaluation of those tenders going forward. The intention is to retain the basic requirement that in the main award criteria must be linked to the subject matter of the contract. And of course, that has many benefits in terms of restricting big um, providers' abilities to offer lots of alternatives and additions to their contract, which actually may not be necessary for the authority and actually may be um, detrimental or um, cause an imbalance in the level playing field vis-a-vis -vis smaller suppliers who are capable of providing the contract but can't necessarily deliver everything else. Having said that, however, there is a proposal to introduce exceptions to that general rule and they'll be set out in statutory guidance issued by the Cabinet Office. And it may not always be necessary for the contracting authorities when evaluating tenders to do so solely from their own perspective, which is the current position. In terms of this, they're looking at ensuring that wider benefits to society and other contracting authorities can be taken into account. Again, this can only happen in a limited range of circumstances and guidance will be issued. And in terms of that, I would fully be expecting to see lots of the provisions around the new social value model to be playing through in some of those circumstances. And that's where you can see that those additional benefits around ensuring suppliers have prompt payment arrangements for their supply chain, that environmental benefits are harnessed will come through. Go on, next slide, Peter. So that takes us on to the exclusion grounds in selection criteria. 
and here's some of the changes are kind of good housekeeping but there are some there is one particular change that's worthy of note and we'll come on to that in a moment the government's proposing to add some new mandatory exclusion grants ones for criminal convictions for fraud and for the non-disclosure of beneficial ownership they're also considering a new discretionary ground which will relate to tax evasion provisions and where a bidder itself is subject to a deferred prosecution agreement Interestingly, the government is now looking to investigate the feasibility of setting up a centrally managed debarment list for mandatory exclusions. And actually, this is another common theme running right through the paper, and you'll hear my colleagues Mike and Louise talk about this more in detail, is actually this desire to keep setting up some central databases to hold different types of information to assist with procurement procedures. In this one, the purpose of the debarment list would be to hold a list of all the suppliers who are subject to one of the mandatory exclusion grounds and therefore who cannot participate in a procurement process. It's a great idea, I suspect, from a contracting authority's perspective, because they might be able to get some certainty about when they can legitimately exclude bidders for mandatory exclusion grants. However, there are obviously a number of issues with that. Firstly, in terms of the ability to set the system up in the first place, but also how it will be managed and kept up to date. You know, it's going to have to cover a vast number of suppliers, including international suppliers, and making sure that that information is constantly up to date because it would be being used on a daily basis will be a challenge from a central perspective. From bidders' perspective, I can imagine this is possibly not necessarily news that they want to hear, and there will be concern about what happens if you end up on the list, and then ultimately how you get off that list as well. Now, there will be further detail around this in due course if they move it forward, but there is a suggestion that bidders would be notified about it and given the chance to kind of appeal that before it moved forward. Even without those challenges, if it moves forward, actually the, the actual practical you know, issues associated with setting up that system and implementing it are not you know, insignificant. And it would remain to be seen actually the speed at which such a system could be set up and whether actually you would see potentially the new regulations brought in to effect before that that's, um, debarment list was ready and that that would follow at a later date or whether actually they would try and get it ready for the launch and the new regulations coming into effect in the first place. Next slide please. So this is the one where there is some significant change potentially and this is around the exclusion for past poor performance and for those of you that are used to evaluating tenders you'll probably have looked at this and either wanted to use it and not really felt confident in being able to use it or not sure you had enough information to move forward with it. Um, it's definitely an area that myself, and my colleagues have advised on extensively. And on the slide there, you'll see how that operates at the moment. So you can exclude a bit of a past poor performance on a discretionary ground, but it is limited. So the performance of a substantive requirement of a prior public contract must have shown significant or persistent deficiencies. And that poor performance must have led to early termination, damages or another comparable sanction. When you come to look at that in practice, quite often we will talk to contracting authorities who say we have heard, but they won't necessarily have concrete evidence relating to anything. And also you can get involved in the situation where you are actually helping a contracting authority or a bidder with a contract management issue. And actually maybe a relationship has turned sour and they both want to walk away from it. And it may be that there have been some breaches of contract. Quite often what you will find is though that suppliers with an eye on being wary of being caught by this exclusion provision going forward, the way out of that contract it is managed in such a way that these provisions wouldn't be triggered in future. However, the government recognises that actually where there is persistent, you know, poor performance of contracts by bidders, you know, they need to almost be held responsible for that and that needs to be allowed to be taken into account in the award of future contracts. So the government is proposing that we retain it, um, but more importantly, that they're going to widen it so it shouldn't simply only be available where the poor past performance has led to specified sanctions like termination. Instead, what they're proposing is that contracting authorities are going to will evaluate contract performance against a set of KPIs included in contracts and the supplier's performance against those KPIs will be published and held on yet another central database. And it's that information then that the other bidders in the, um, the other contracting authorities in the market will be able to look at when they're considering their selection stage evaluation. Of course, that's not necessarily 
a straightforward situation to be in because if you think about the vast array of contracts that are let under the public contracts regulations, coming up with sets of KPIs for all of those contracts won't necessarily always be um, comparable. They won't always necessarily be easily translatable into this scenario. And there'll be many contracts that are let where KPIs are simply not relevant. And you may find contracting authorities in a position where they have to start developing KPIs for contracts that they wouldn't ordinarily do so. And then there's going to be a, a real risk and balance issue in making sure that they are suitable given the potential um, downside to failing to meet those for the bidders and also that they're not disproportionate to the contract that's being delivered in the first place. So again, I think that's a really interesting area. We're going to need to see that one develop as the consultation progresses. And I think that Oh, selection and award criteria. Um, so final slide, I think, on this. Um, the current distinction will remain between selection and award criteria. And yet again, we're going to have a registration system. So another system which will hold suppliers' basic details. Um, and that will, again, in, the intention is that it will reduce the bureaucracy. Suppliers won't have to provide as much information. Contract wing authorities will have access to it in this central database. But again, you know, we're going to have the same limitations and the same um, potential practical issues to overcome in setting that up in the first place as we are with the other central systems that are being proposed. The other big point to note is that actually they're looking to remove the limitations that exist in the current regulation 60 about in terms of the type and range of information that could be used to carry out your selection criteria verification and that I think is something that will be welcomed by a number of contracting authorities. And that's it so I am going to hand over now thank you very much. Thank you very much Rachel. Um, before I go on can I just remind everybody that if you have got any questions to ask to put them through the chat facility and we will pick those up at the end. So I'm going to go on now to look at chapter five, um, which the green paper um, talks about what they call commercial purchasing tools. And those are frameworks, dynamic purchasing systems, and um, exclusively from the utilities uh, sector, the use of qualification systems, which I'll explain in a second. The intention is that the new provisions will apply across the piece. So we will also apply to concessions. So if you look at concessions regulations currently, you don't have these tools available. So there is an intention it would apply there as well. It's quite difficult to see how that would practically be used. Concessions tend to be more bespoke type procurements um, in any event. So you know, let's wait and see if that has any practical application. So the, the, the first proposal that we have is with regard to dynamic purchasing systems, and they talk about the introduction of a DPS plus. And I think for those of us who've looked at the dynamic purchasing systems since they were first introduced, I think this has moved from being sort of unworkable to workable, but not necessarily that you know, fantastic to really so as, a, as, as a tool for procurement. But I think there is actually some grounds for optimism in the proposals here that these, the DPS plus should become a real you know, absolute sort of tool that you will have um, in your armory as a procurer you know, for, for, for many sort of purchases. So let's have a look at, at what, what it covers, but I did mention that it, it, it incorporates also this, this concept of qualification systems from the UCRs, which will, and this will apply across the piece. So qualification systems are essentially a sort of select list or a standing list. So nothing that looks at tender type issues, nothing about how a contractor will perform um, a particular contract or what the price would be, but it's just about their qualification to undertake anything um, that, that might come up under a sort of a framework or, or a DPS arrangement. And that really is the, the nub of what we're seeing in this DPS plus system. So it's very much around the qualifications of people to bid for the opportunities that come up. So. So what will we see in it? Well, first of all, and some of these are familiar from the, from the old DPS system, it, they will remain continuously open. So, and, 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 it's, and measures will be taken on find a tender, which is the new term, you know, which has replaced OGU. Now we've gone beyond transition. Measures will be taken to enable suppliers to find open DPS plus systems. It will be a, a question of simply waiting for the contracting authority to reopen a DPS at sort of given points. They should be continuously open. And as I say, there should be the ability for would-be suppliers to search for opportunities of that type and to then 
um, bid to join that particular um, DPS. Th there will be no limitation on the numbers that can be placed in the DPS. So, so long as the supplier is eligible, then they must be admitted to the DPS. And you can see the potential of those DPSs for certain to the particular goods or services or works would potentially grow quite large. They can be open-ended, but probably can be time limited too. So I think the opportunity is there for the, for the authority in the first place to say this is a four or five year DPS, but, but they can be open-ended. But if they are open-ended, then there must be some provision made in the original notice for how the DPS would come to an end, how it would be terminated and for the authority to move on with a new DPS and new framing of its procurement needs around a particular category. There is no direct award um, with the DPS. There has to be a procurement exercise before award to um, any of the suppliers who are on the DPS. And, and it seems probable that the new competitive flexible procedure, which Rachel referred to, will be the procedure that will be used. And that sort of seems logical, um, given that there are now to be only three procedures. It's quite hard to see how you would work any other procedure in this. But I say it's probable because at different points in the green paper, at one point it says it must be used, and at another point it says it could be used. Um, so it possibly leaves open for a more slightly bespoke procedure that would apply under, un, under this type of arrangement, reflecting the relative simplicity. And I think as Rachel indicated, I mean, the fact, the fact that we're talking about competitive, flexible procedure, you shouldn't necessarily equate that with being the, a complex procedure. It's more like a light touch where you have quite a lot of discretion as to how you will undertake the procurement. And it seems to me appropriate where you have a DPS and you've already got, um, this should be for your more simple procedures that you can actually have quite sort of relatively quick and dirty procedures to get the winning sort of um, tender that you, that you are seeking. Next slide, please, Peter. So let's have a look then um, at frameworks, move on from DPS. So frameworks, the proposal is to have two categories now, open and closed. And this is said to address um, or, or to allow for an increase in innovation. I have to say, I find that a little bit hard to square with the real point of frameworks, which is that they are largely there for your repetitive, high volume commodity type purchases. But nevertheless, that's what it says. I suspect what they mean is, more flexibility. And I think as we look at the, what they call the open framework, then you can see where some flexibility has been introduced into the whole world of, of, of frameworks. As yet, the green paper is not saying anything about a number of sort of old chestnuts on the frameworks, but nothing about eligibility to join a framework, nothing about volume or in, in, a, a purchases that can be made for any particular contracting authority who is on a, a sort of a central purchasing body type framework. And in fact, not really anything about central purchasing body frameworks or individual frameworks and how they would potentially work if they did differently. And certainly nothing leads yet on things like joint procurement, et cetera, which tend to fall into this category. But let's have a look at the two, um, the two categories of framework that we have. The first one is, is closed, and I think it is largely what you have now. So um, the, the existing rules that, that you, you know from frameworks will, will largely apply. So you set up your framework up to a four year limit and that's it. Once you're on it, you're on it. Nobody else can join and that, that's the end of it. But we have now the possibility of an open framework and this has a number of substantial differences to the current regime. So first of all, it can run for a term of up to eight years. But one of the suggestions is that you wouldn't be able to um, get so so having it for eight years, then it will allow new providers to be able to join the framework at predetermined points. The first predetermined points cannot be before three years. So it's saying that even if you have up to eight years, then there needs to be a period where you have some sort of certainty at least three years. Begs the question whether a uh, a, a, a clever authority decides if it just simply would like a long closed framework that they may simply open up the framework in year eight so that actually you just have a sort of set framework for a longer period. Query, query whether that will work and whether that's a loophole that might be closed. Um, 
once you get beyond the three years, then it seems to say that authorities can um, have as many openings up of the framework as, as they choose. And actually, when you think about it, that in some ways is say, it's not saying that frameworks can be up to eight years. It's saying that after three years, you can be having a new framework with, with some, regular, some regularity. So how would this work for the um, suppliers who are on a framework? Well, I think there are some interesting issues for them to, to be aware of. Obviously, once you're on a framework, it does give a degree of certainty and, 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 and a, 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 an existing framework and a closed, um, a, a closed arena, really, in which you can sort of like bid for work. The, the intention to open it up, obviously, is opening up to other suppliers. So if you are an existing supplier, then you may want the opportunity to rebid when the opening up happens. Now, why might, might you do that? Well, as the authority opens it up, then it could be that new suppliers are coming on with more aggressive pricing, better terms, which may see you falling off the framework. So it may be, although you've got the option to stay where you are and not do anything with your bid, you may find yourself falling off the framework if you're not also refreshing your position on the framework. So existing suppliers will probably always have to keep um, abreast of changes so they can keep refreshing their bids. And in similar vein, the contracting authority itself may limit the numbers on a framework. So when it opens it up, then all existing suppliers must rebid to, to stay on it. So while this is presented, as I say, as an eight-year framework, it could be that you're getting regular re-procurements, and it clearly would have to be sort of almost like a full re-procurement in, in those, those circumstances. Next slide, please, Peter. So a, few, a couple of common rules then to DPSs and, and frameworks. Well, um, we've talked a lot about um, centralization. The intention is that there shall be an establishment of a central register maintaining details of all active uh, frameworks and DPSs to enable comparison between different options available um, to suppliers. Um, there is intention for additional transparency. All awards will be visible. So not just the framework itself, but the awards under the framework. And I think that will potentially be an administrative burden, but, but let's see, it's understandable why they might want to do that. Direct awards, um, the intention has been that under frameworks, not DPS, but under frameworks, the ability to make a direct award will remain. It will be interesting to see if they'll possibly sort of tidy up some of the confusion around direct awards that I, I, I find in the frameworks. I and mean, you can have three different types of ways of award on the framework, framework, either directly just by mini competition or exercising the discretion between direct award and mini competition. And I think it would be helpful if some, some, some clarity was brought to that situation. And, and also, it, it, helpfully, I think it, it, it refers to the fact that the, the suppliers who cease to be eligible can be removed from frameworks. Um, so so some, some, some interesting um, changes to, to come there. Next slide, then, Peter. So the next chapter is about open and transparent contracting. And the Green Paper notes that there's currently a... Um, fragmented picture when it comes to centralised initiatives to bring commonality to public procurement. Most contracting authorities rely on a small number of specialist e-senders and e-procurement systems, but, but the data on these systems is not in a common format, no sharing of common data systems. And that's something government would really like to get to grips with. So there are three elements to this chapter. Um, firstly, centralisation or increased transparency, depending upon your perspective. Secondly, publication of basic disclosure information. And, and then finally, a central common platform, which, which we've already touched on in a couple of places that we'll come back to. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, oh, sorry, Peter, can you just drop back? Sorry, one slide. So in terms of the, um, the first aspect of this, so recording, um, the, the information that, that goes on in the procurement. So we currently, you should be familiar with the Regulation 84 record, although undoubtedly it doesn't always get observed. The intention is certainly to push this really sort of like right up into the um, 
front and, and, and center of, of how procurement shall be done. So it is going to be a, an absolute requirement to make a record which is a critical part of the procurement process since it will not be possible to progress to award and stand still without the publication of this record. The record will be very similar to the Regulation 84 record that we have now, which is recording every step of the procurement. But the key difference is about not being able to move to award without the publication of the record. And I think this is where it gets really interesting because it, it makes it clear in the green paper that the information to be published as part of that includes evaluation reports and evaluation disclosure. Now, Louise will come on to some of the changes that affect sort of the, the whole issue around challenge. Um, and one of those is sort of changes to the standstill sort of issues. What we're going to see is that really the important um, stage is, is this pre-award stage and looking at the information which the authority puts onto its, its record of the procurement. And suppliers, I think, will be examining very closely that information, particularly around the evaluation reports, to see whether they agree with the, with the decisions that the authority has made. Uh, next slide now, Peter. So the next um, aspect of this uh, chapter is to look at what the, is called the um, open and contracting data standard. And, and, and whilst that is a, is a plea for compliance, I think the key aspects here is with regard to a new set of procurement notices. So the intentions are that in a standardized form, you will see notices that cover the usual sort of territory. But there are a couple of interesting extra points for me that come out of the green paper in that it takes the spread slightly beyond the current scope of notices, both looking at pre-procurement and post-procurement. So it suggests that notices will have to be um, published indicating procurement pipeline, including um, procurement budgets, which obviously is going to be very interesting information to the supplier market. And at the end of the procurement, once you get into contract, that there appears to be intention also that notices will be um, have to be published about the management of contracts and contractors and the, um, this, the, 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 the issues of payment and so on will all have to be um, actually published. So, so interesting stuff um, around, around the whole um, issue of transparency. Next slide. So the last point on, on chapter six then is, is as has already been indicated, the setting up of a central um, platform. And this is not just about common formats, but this is about a central repository of information. The centralization of procurement is, is, is definitely a common theme. You've heard it from probably all of us so far um, in, in this green paper. And, and this really is, 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 is another example of that with this central platform. But as I say, it's not just about information about the usual tender opportunities, but also very interestingly, I think, central debarment list, as, as, as Rachel indicated. I mean, I mean, if you're on this list, you know, it's not just one authority excluding you. It's, it's there, it sort of takes you as a supplier completely out of um, the procurement market. Um, but it goes beyond that. There's a lot of other sort of interesting stuff there. So a register of complaints. We will be familiar, no doubt, with the... Um, the, um, the current system that we have, which is the sort of like the mystery shopper um, system. But this seems to be going, taking on to a, a step further. And, and for an authority, you know, the, this register of complaints, it looks a little bit, you know, um, all one way. It sort of looks like TripAdvisor without the good reviews, really. It's just a sort of like a central repository where people can see what local authorities, health trusts, universities, et cetera, are not doing very well. So a whole list of complaints. So it'll be interesting to see if there's any balance in all of that. There will also be a register of legal challenges, which again, very interesting in terms of what that says about the, the authorities who are subject to challenges. Don't know yet what that will actually mean. Does it mean letters of complaint? Does it mean formal actions through the courts? We need to, be, need to see. 
And as Peter mentioned, I think at the very beginning of this, I mean, it begs the question as to what the sanctions are for non-compliance with some of this. You know, if an authority doesn't put its challenge onto the central platform, so what? Does, are there any sanctions for the authority? What about other information that must be put on there? Does the procurement remain valid if properly done, even though certain information hasn't been put into this central procurement um, repository of information? All interesting stuff, I think, for the future. But for now, I'll hand over to Louise, who's going to talk about challenge and remedies. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so we're going on to chapter seven, which is around access to justice. Um, so at present, the system to challenge a procurement decision to many is seen as um, lengthy, expensive and complex for the most part, and at the forefront, forefront of the minds of both suppliers and contracting authorities is, is the exposure litigation brings from a reputational and cost perspective. And it's often seen as a barrier to getting some address for potentially a wrong decision, but also can prevent contracting authorities from defending decisions where possibly they can do. And also, not have the risk appetite for taking that uh, running with that litigation risk we've seen in our own experience that costs can be extensive in in a procurement litigation um, so especially in this economy those decisions aren't taken lightly so whilst the green paper does propose some quite major changes to the review system perhaps it doesn't go quite as far as we initially thought it would do so for example there's no introduction of a new tribunal system at this time but I'll touch upon that again in a moment but there are still some very significant changes that the pros proposals will bring in which can potentially change the landscape of procurement litigation going forward if it if these proposals are brought in um, thank you Peter um, so the government proposes a number of elements um, which should be considered for inclusion with any new set of civil procedure rules or practice directions which will be specifically for public procurement and the first one will be around a tailored fast track system so this will allow for an expedited trial process with active case management which can be tailored to spe specifically to the individual challenge so it will focus on um, different factors depending on what the what the procurement is in question but in terms of is the is it urgent for the award to take place is it needed right away the volume of the, the vault sorry the value of the claim the stage of the procurement process when the dispute took place so it's all about tailoring it to that specific procurement um, also they are considering using paper only submissions so the intention here is that for certain type of claims um, they'll be reviewed on the basis of only written pleadings um, and these proceedings would likely be subject to a maximum recommended length um, of time and I think the government's aim here is to reduce the need for both sides to kind of incur um, expensive legal fees and, 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 and expensive barrister costs, um, which is inevitably needed if, if um, uh, issue, uh, proceedings are issued. Um, it's not clear at the moment what type of claim this would be limited to, and it's likely that will be, like, be discussed as part of the cons consultation process. But in my view, it's likely to be more the kind of the straightforward procurement challenges where there are not so many issues um, in disputes. They're also looking to um, introduce some new rules around disclosure. So disclosure at the moment plays a, signif a significant part in the length of a procurement challenge. So contracting authorities obviously have concerns about commercially sensitive information, disclosing information that could prejudice the rerun of, of a competition, if ultimately that is the position they find themselves in. But then on the other hand, um, potential claimants are seeking to kind of address that um, imbalance that inevitably happens in, in procurement. Contracting authorities have all the information. They don't have the information they want to know, kind of that to be able to understand whether they have um, any real grounds for challenge or any potential complaints. So the, gov the government hopes that the new um, 
proposed transparency requirements that Mike has already touched on earlier will help to resolve some of these issues. So the bidder should already have this information on contract award. Um, so it's likely to go beyond what is currently required in a standstill later, uh, sorry, standstill letter. And this more comprehensive proactive disclosure should reduce the, the need for the information which is traditionally sought under the disclosure process through the court system. It's also hoped that there'll be clear rules for disclosure on different types of challenge and, and whether these will be provided as a matter of course in a particular type of challenge. For example, timescales for establishing a confidentiality ring um, where you would uh, provide information to a limited amount of people, normally lawyers, so they can assess the information and, whether, and see whether there is a, a challenge to pursue. Um, um, also times for putting in pleadings and defence, that type of thing. So a standardised approach there. Um, the Green Paper also um, looks to introduce um, more common time scale, sorry, timescales for certain types of proceedings. So this would include timescales for pleadings, amending claims. And again, all of this is hoping to reduce the time frame for the overall procurement challenge, which some people at the moment see as a significant barrier to defending a claim because the process can be so lengthy, it would actually be quicker to kind of concede and rerun the process again, uh, rather than standing firm and defending, defending, the, defending the position. On to the next slide, please. Thank you. So as I touched upon earlier, at the moment, um, there is no introduction of a new tribunal um, system, which is part of the earlier engagement. I think uh, people were helping that would ho help, help with the cost and time burdens, which are currently part and parcel of a procurement challenge. So at the moment, the, pr uh, the pr proposals focus more on reforming the court process and retaining that knowledge of the TCC. So whilst tribunals have been part, the paper does state that they'll continue to explore whether a tribunal process will be used in the future for low level claims or claims um, of around issues which are about an ongoing process. So for example, wrongful, wrongful exclusion, uh, SQ, or whether there's something in the specification that is discriminatory. So we'll just have to watch this space to see whether that will be introduced in the future or whether that will be explored a bit more. And it's likely that if the um, court reforms don't offer that access to justice and, and the benefits that are hoped, the tribunal system might be explored a bit further. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so remedies. Um, so. The reform on remedies in the Green Paper is focused mainly around pre-contractual remedies becoming the norm and the standard rather than a focus on damages. Um, and I think that's pretty in line with um, the private sector and suppliers' primary motivation for challenging. Their primary motivation normally is to secure the contract or get another chance at bidding for the contract rather than an award of damages. So formally stating this preference on pre-contractual remedies within the regulation is in part consistent with the motivations of, of potential claimants. Um, again, this will only work um, so the focus and the shift to pre-contractual remedies will only work if it if it works hand in hand with some of the other potential reforms that Mike and Peter and Rachel have discussed today. So the shortened timescales, the disclosure requirements, um, the publication of information um, that we currently see within a Regulation 84 report. Um, one of so the next the next proposal is around capping liability and this is probably going to be one of the more controversial decisions um, within chapter seven depending obviously on what side of the fence you sit and um, the proposal uh, to cap the level of damages um, an aggrieved bidder can seek is it will be limited to or it's being proposed to be limited to 1.5 um, times the bid costs um, as well as the legal fees and this is substantially different to the position we have at the minute currently 
the extent of damages that can be awarded to a supplier for the breach of regulations amounts to the sum of lost profit, bid costs and legal costs. Um, so that is, you know, a, a significant difference um, between um, the proposal regime and what we have at the moment. And the government's position on this is they believe it, they believe the current system encourages speculative claims from bidders and uh, bidders, especially incumbents who want to to kind of secure potentially lucrative extensions in the interim period, whilst the challenge process is going through the courts. Um, and it's really interesting because I think it's safe to say that the risk of financial exposure acts as a pretty good deter deterrent against poor procurement, poor procurement practice. And but it can also make, on the flip side, make contracting authorities risk adverse then not potentially trying out new innovative ways to procure stifling discussions with the market because they're worried about kind of the cost implications of a procurement challenge if everything goes wrong so a shift in the focus of damages um, and the cap on 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 liability could really change the landscape of procurement uh, procurements going forward and those 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 kind of risk profile decisions that both contracting authorities and suppliers make. Oh, just uh, also I should just kind of make clear that there isn't there is potentially um, uh, the courts can go above and beyond that 1.5 bid costs and legal costs um, if uh, a, a, a contracting a contract notice was never issued in the first place. So if you've used kind of the crisis um, um, exemptions, then there is scope for in the proposals for the uh, costs to uh, the liability to exceed the damages claim to exceed that. Thank you. So uh, the next point is on kind of automatic suspension. Um, at the moment, the test whether uh, for automatic suspension is based on a case from the 1970s. It's not a procurement case. I think it was on IP infringement. So it's not specific to procurement law and the proposals within the green paper set out a replacement test with a more appropriate procurement specific test, which would consider things like the balance of public interest, urgency, upholding of the regulations, impact on the supplier, the right to be included in the procurement process versus alternative remedies. Um, and I think all in all, it's hoped that the package of reforms that's been discussed today will mean that there will be very limited times where uh, a requirement to lift an automatic suspension will actually be required. So it will become kind of uh, uh, rarely used as much as it is at the moment. Thank you. The next chapter, we move on to chapter eight, contract modifications. So currently, when a contracting authority um, is amending a contract during its term, the variation must fall within one of the safe harbours set out in Regulation 72 of the PCR or the equivalent in, in, within the other regulations. And if that variation isn't covered, it's likely to trigger the need to run a new procurement process. So as part of these government proposals, the Green Paper sets out a way of trying to give more flexibility to contracting authorities. Um, all in all, there's not drastic changes to Regulation 72, but they do provide them with more flexibility to modify contracts, um, including in times of crisis and extreme urgency. And these mirror the um, the regulations that Rachel was talking about earlier in terms of um, Regulation 32, and this will be a new limb added to Regulation 72. So currently, in terms of uh, when there is something, an urgent requirement and there's a need to change um, a, an existing contract, we would rely on the unforeseen circumstances. And as we've seen during this COVID-19 crisis, that hasn't always been the easiest test to follow uh, because it's not specifically made for this type of requirement. So um, it's hoped that there will be gives a bit more flexibility in those in those circumstances, but we'll have to wait to see exactly what that test is and what the devil in the detail is. Um, the definition of substantial in Regulation 72.8 uh, 
um, could also um, also is going to be reordered and combined with the rest of the regulations in 7221 and it's hoped that this will make it a bit easier to understand as it's currently written in the regulations it's a bit back to front and it doesn't really it's not the easiest regulation to read um but it just i think it, the the emphasis will shift so we'll talk more about what can be legally enforceable as opposed to what constitutes a substantial amendment so I think it's just hopeful that hope hoping that contracting authorities will be able to see more clearly what is legally enforceable and make those decisions about how to manage their contracts during the term going forward the um the next point is contract amendment notices and i think this is a really interesting point currently when you're amending a contract you only require to publish a contract amendment notice if if you are amending it under two grounds so for technical reasons or for un, unforeseen circumstances if you're not doing it under those grounds there is no requirement to issue a contract amendment notice and the, so here there's a real shift in terms of in terms of visibility modification advice is something we advise on day in and day out so we are aware that variations happen all the time and you'll be aware that variations happen to your contracts all of the time but but there are very rarely any challenges on modifying a contract um, and the reason is, you know, for very different, there might be different mitigating factors in that they're waiting for um, the brand new contract to be released if it's an extension. But, but, but for the most case, it's because it's just not visible. The market aren't aware that contracting authorities are making these changes. So with this requirement to put out a contract amendment notice, um, this, will, this will increase the visibility of these changes um, substantially. There are some exemptions from uh, from making those placing those contract amendment notices. So, if the increase or decrease um, in the value is less than ten percent of the initial contract value, uh, or fifteen percent for works, if the increase or decrease in the initial contract term by less than ten percent of the original contract term, and it does not change the scope of the contract. So, it's really important to remember that because normally when changes are made to contract it inevitably does change the scope of the contract so irrespective of a value if the if the scope of the contract is changing the the need to put a contract amendment notice out will be required another interesting point that the green paper includes is the requirement for a new mandatory standstill period um, so with the exception of amendments uh, for crisis or extreme urgency, a standstill period of 10 days will apply to all contract amendments which require um, the publication of a, of a contract amendment notice. So this means that contracting authorities and their incumbent providers won't be able to kind of implement the variation until they've waited that 10 days from, from publishing the contract amendment notice. Um, this is useful in some respects. So it, it provides a useful limitation point. So the limitation period would start from the date of the, publicate, of the publication of the contract amendment notice. So it kind of helps you mitigate, helps contracting authorities mitigate some, some risk, but it also gives suppliers the chance to challenge um, or kind of um, raise concerns about particular variations and whether they are actually within the remit of the public contract regulations. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the practical impact of these reforms would mean that V notice within these circumstances are rendered unnecessary. We have seen, we have seen um, the use of V notices, especially within modifications, um, being not being used very often over the last couple of years. Historically, they were used all the time, every time the contract authority wanted to either make a change or, or make um, um, place an award uh, without competition. Um, 
because you have to have the valid justification in the the VEAT notices are, are used kind of not as, as often anymore and especially with the use of a co contracting uh, sorry a uh, modification notice in these circumstances going forward the use of VEAT notices would be rendered kind of null and void um, the government is also seeking to impose a legislative cap on profits that suppliers can make uh, for contracts which have to be extended as a, as, a, as a result of a new award process being suspended so if um, this just kind of helps it helps um, contracting authorities not being over a barrel in terms of the negotiations on any extensions and just prevent incumbent providers from spuriously challenging decisions to get those profits from uh, their existing contract for the period of time it takes to either rerun the process or go through the court system, um, which can be, as we all know, probably 18, 18 months plus at the moment. Thank you. That's the end of my session. Great. Thanks, Louise. I think we've got a few questions um, in the um, chat box. Um, there's quite a few questions about threshold. Um, uh, I think I'll answer that one very quickly. Um, uh, in reality, the, what we're talking about here is the principle of thresholds being the same in that um, it is applying to contracts which are above the relevant thresholds. And for the moment, of course, the thresholds are remaining the same, but they will, will be looked at next year. Um, there have been some policy notes which have been issued recently in relation to below threshold contracts and the ability of contracting authorities to reserve those for UK suppliers. Um, and so um, the distinction between below and above threshold contracts has already changed to some extent as a result of our completion of the exit from the union um, but that principle won't um, change in any material respect we don't think as a result of any new changes which would come about as a result of um, the um, implementation of public procurement changes under this green paper um, Mike there's a couple for you I think um, do you want to take the um, one in relation to online evaluation criteria? Yes, I can. I think there was one before that, but um, I'll, I'll deal with that one first. Um, the, 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 the procedures as set out in the green paper do not make any distinction there. So very much a big part of what, what the government is proposing is the importance of this pre-publication disclosure of information about the evaluation. And I think as Louise was saying, one of the things that they're concerned about with challenge is to, is to see challenge made, so it's like pre-procurement, pre-outcome pre of procurement and not after the event. So it is actually quite an important aspect of this, that, this, that the, the evaluation material is all out there so that bidders can then have a look at themselves. And, and make decisions themselves about whether they want to sort of take a challenge as opposed to um, relying upon what the authority has selected as the you know, characteristics and relative advantages of the tender. Basically, it's the authority just has to put this information out there. But it does put the onus on the supplier then to look at that and decide whether they're happy with all of that. I can't see any distinction for any particular type of evaluation. So I think that that's something that will have to be looked at when authorities are doing some form of online evaluation to make sure that effectively there is no reward and that there is this ability to, to review the reports first. I think there was right. one before that, Peter, yeah, on... Yeah, do you want to take that one as well? You Mike, did, yes. For you, Rachel. Yeah, so under new, are we able to, not able to direct award to customer choice and control? Um, I, I mean, query whether, as Rachel said, there may be some exclusion for health and care related, but certainly the, the DPS plus, yes, there is no direct award. Um, and that is sort of logical, really, because it is, as I mentioned, very much a sort of select standing list. It's all about selection type criteria. It's just basically saying that this contractor is good enough to do a particular contract. Unlike a framework, where in a framework procurement, you actually bid 
and say something about the subject matter of the framework. So you're putting in information about how you would carry out contracts awarded under the framework, including potentially pricing information. The DPS plus doesn't go that far. So the logic is that you would always have competition um, to, to, for everybody on the DPS plus um, to actually make an award of a contract. Great, thanks, Mike. One for you, Rachel. Do you want to take the question on limitation? Oh, sorry, not the question on limitation. The um, oh, one I've just sent to you. Are you on mute, Rachel. Rachel. <laughs> Still on mute, Rachel. That might be a Louise, do you want to take quickly take the question on limitation and we'll come back to Rachel? Yes, yeah, so the green green paper doesn't set out any changes to the limitation periods. I think at the moment that might be something that comes out in in the detail. So I, I assume you mean the 30 day limitation period for bringing a challenge. The, there is no reference to that at the moment within within the green within the green paper. Great. Rachel, do you want to have another go? Me now. Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the question that we had was, is there an encouragement to move away from multi-stage procedures now, like the traditional restricted procedure that we're used to, or would you use that through the new competitive flexible procedure? And I think that's the answer, is it's maximum flexibility for authorities. There will be a retained open one-stage procedure, but if you want to use two stages, use the new competitive flexible process and then design it to suit your needs. There will still be selection and award criteria as we discussed previously conscious of time and um, we will answer all of the questions by following up with individuals i'll just end in terms of uh, a question in relation to when will the green cover will be uh, a substantial uk procurement law um i guess the questions of um the answer to that is that we don't know um this at this stage is still a consultation paper indeed it's a green paper rather than a white paper so um, they are looking for the market to respond to the issues and the points that they have raised um uh, there is um a lot of legislation required as a result of our exit from uh, the european union which is required and whether this um um uh, area of law will take precedent over others we don't know however uh, i think the general understanding is that this is quite high up um, minister's agenda and they are keen to see this um, in practice however even if this does become law you'll have noted from a lot of the things that we've talked about that there is lots of things that need to be done before it can be um, fully brought into um action so um, even if the law if even if there was um, a legislative window in the next um, parliamentary year I would imagine there would be some gap between it uh, um, becoming law and going into force um, because of all of the central um, issues that need to be um, brought in and particularly the registers and the changes of approaches that will be needed um, by contracting authorities. So um, this is still a consultation and there are opportunities to engage with that. And with that, I will um, ask Mike to talk about some of the workshops that we are, um, are holding. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, as for those of you who have actually read, had a chance to look at the green paper, you will see that there are lots of consultation questions in there. Um, so there's a lot of, not only food for thought in terms of the text generally of the green paper, but some specific issues the government would like feedback from um, the consultees and that's everybody effectively public and private sector who, who, who wishes to do so. Um, from our perspective and we will be responding um, to that we thought it would be helpful to engage with our clients to facilitate the opportunity to come together and, 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 and get, get involved in that response um, basis but what we've done to make it workable but also so that we can reflect in particular concerns of any particular sector or subsector is we've broken it down now into a series of working groups that we're holding over the next couple of weeks, um, which we're inviting you to get involved with. And even if you perhaps don't want to go forward or have your organisation going forward as part of the sort of like referencing in that consultation process, I think it will be a useful opportunity for you to 
discuss the issues of concern to you with your peers from your sector, and we're happy to facilitate that. The particular dates are set out on the slide there. They were on the original um, information for, for this. I would encourage you to get involved quickly. Can I particularly mention uh, local government? The original information talked about um, an event next Wednesday. That is still going ahead, but it is now full up um, because we, we had a lot of um, take up from when we ran this webinar just before Christmas. So we're putting in place a, a second event on the 22nd of January. Um, I'm anticipating that might get full as well. So it will literally be first come first serve. Email me as set out in the invitation and the first 20 that I get, they, they, they will go on to the working group. But if, if you're not able to and you wish to make responses to us and want us to help with that, then please do get in touch. We're not trying to be, be the, you know, excluding anybody if, if we can avoid it but yeah please do get involved thank you right thanks mike um uh Thanks ever so much to everyone who's joined today. Um, you will see in the um, chat that um, Natasha has put a feedback survey link in. It's a very quick survey and we would really, really appreciate if you could spend five minutes just filling that in. Um, but ultimately, um, that is the end of today's webinar. Um, we will do a response to the questions and as someone has um, suggested, we'll do that as a question and answer page for everyone. Um, hopefully that will be helpful and of course an email will go around with the slides uh, that we presented to today in due course thanks very much everyone um, stay safe and uh, look forward to speaking to um, all or some of you uh, again it, uh, shortly take care bye <laughs>